My name is Benjamin Lebwal. I'm the Director of Clinical Research at the Celiac Disease Center at Columbia University in New York. I'm an adult gastroenterologist. I've been a practicing gastroenterologist since 2010 when I completed my training clinically and also in epidemiology and research methods. One series of studies that I worked on over the last few years that I can now look back on and say uh, there is a common theme and hopefully this is helping the celiac disease community are the studies with regard to healing. Uh, patients with celiac disease have uh, damaged intestines on biopsy. We call it villus atrophy. And with time on a strict gluten-free diet, the villi can heal. In fact, in certain patients, they can normalize to an extent that it, it's indistinguishable from someone without celiac disease. That can often take years, uh, but for patients, it can validate their experience of strict gluten avoidance. But until recently, we didn't really know whether healing was linked to clinically important outcomes. We look for results that don't just look good on paper in terms of a pathology report, but results that can enhance longevity, quality of life, the lived experience of people with celiac disease. So in collaboration with a team of investigators led by Jonas Ludvigsen at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, we looked at those individuals who had celiac disease and had a second biopsy to assess for healing. We then compared people who healed to people who didn't heal on that first follow-up biopsy. And we asked ourselves, could this be linked to lifespan, mortality risk, and also a series of other potential diseases or outcomes associated with celiac disease? Well, the answer to the first question in terms of mortality risk was that healing or not healing did not impact that. Fortunately, the risk of mortality in celiac disease is not that much different, not that much more increased compared to the general population. And those who fail to heal compared to those who heal, there wasn't a significant difference. But we went on and in a series of studies looked at other outcomes. For example, lymphoma. It's one of the more common cancers that can occur in people with celiac disease. We found that people who failed to heal on their follow-up biopsy had an increased risk of lymphoma compared to people who healed. We also looked at fracture risk and we found that people who failed to heal on follow-up biopsy had an increased risk of hip fracture and other likely osteoporosis related fractures compared to people who healed. But we also found some good news. We found, for example, that women who had a follow-up biopsy and then subsequently had a pregnancy, there was no difference with regard to any adverse outcome with regard to uh, premature delivery, low birth weight, miscarriage, etc. when comparing people who failed to heal to those who did heal. And the primary reason for that is that everyone did well. There were no major differences compared to the general population with regard to those obstetric outcomes. A lot has been studied and written about celiac disease and various fertility and obstetric issues. It turns out much of that which we worry about is related to undiagnosed and untreated celiac disease. And so the fundamental message of that study is one of reassurance. People who have been diagnosed with celiac disease and are doing their best to be on a gluten-free diet generally have good obstetric outcomes. So this was a series of studies and, and we're not finished. We're looking at a number of other outcomes. Uh, and we think that this has put the follow-up biopsy in a special place with regard to how to manage celiac disease and the role of the follow-up biopsy. Right now, I think we're doing really good work with regard to awareness. Um, and that's thanks to groups like Beyond Celiac that have really raised the bar with regard to making the general public more aware of what are the various different ways someone could present with celiac disease, how it can run in families, when to get tested. There are many aspects of celiac disease that need better study. First of all, with 
compa comparing celiac disease to other digestive diseases, celiac disease is underfunded. There is a dedicated core of basic scientists, immunologists, epidemiologists, clinical researchers who are doing much of the celiac disease research, and we would love for that tent to be much bigger. The reason it's not bigger is because there are fewer grant mechanisms and grant funds available to study celiac disease. And when that's the case, there are fewer people who are interested in celiac disease. What could we be doing better? We need to better understand what triggers celiac disease in genetically susceptible individuals. How come 40% of us have the celiac related gene, but only 1% of us get celiac disease? That needs to be better understood. Why is it that some people with celiac disease and intestinal damage don't feel that ill when they eat gluten by accident, or even in some people a little bit on purpose sometimes, whereas other people get exposed to even trace amounts and they get severely ill? It's a big unanswered question in celiac disease. This discrepancy between how much gluten one's exposed to, how much damage occurs in the intestine, and how bad one feels. What we really need to do is develop a more personalized medicine. So we can tell someone patient A is very sensitive to gluten and needs to take every precaution, whereas patient B could have perhaps a more permissive approach to the gluten-free diet. We can't be more permissive at this point because we don't know the long-term safety consequences of doing that, but with better and more research, we could potentially identify patients and risk stratify them, triaging them to different approaches of the gluten-free diet. It's long been assumed that the gluten-free diet is all we need in celiac disease, but we now know that that assumption is flawed. There are multiple problems with that. First of all, a lot of patients with celiac disease have ongoing symptoms despite trying their best on a gluten-free diet. For some of those patients, it's because of inadvertent gluten exposure. For still other patients, it's because of coexisting conditions that can go along with celiac disease that are undiagnosed. And for a small proportion of patients, and thankfully it's a small proportion, there is refractory celiac disease in which intestinal damage and symptoms of malabsorption are ongoing despite strict gluten avoidance. We've studied the question of whether patients are open to alternatives to the gluten-free diet. We've performed surveys of our patients. The majority of patients are interested in non-dietary therapies. Now, some patients are more hesitant than others, and some are not looking for a cure and are quite content to continue attempting a gluten-free diet for life, but would like to have an option that would offer some protection when they're eating out or taking any sort of chance when they're eating something where their, their confidence in, in potential gluten content is less than 100%. Uh, other patients really are waiting for a cure. They can't wait until they could have a slice of pizza again. We want to meet patients where they are and we want to look at the science at where it is. I think realistically, a first attainable goal would be affording extra protection among those who are already attempting a gluten-free diet. But it's certainly possible that one day with sufficient research funding and advances, a cure could be found in which a patient with celiac disease would be able to tolerate a regular or gluten-containing diet. The patient plays a central role in the performance of celiac disease research. Ultimately, it's about the patient. The patient drives the unmet need. We are studying non-dietary therapies in celiac disease because patients are telling us that the gluten-free diet is not satisfactory or insufficient. We are studying the triggers of celiac disease because patients are telling us stories about how they went from being able to tolerate gluten and not having celiac disease to suddenly in the middle of life developing intestinal damage. We are studying persistent symptoms in celiac disease because that's what patients are concerned about. And we are studying the implications of healing versus not healing on follow-up biopsy because patients are concerned about long-term risks. Without the patients, there is no research.